Uh, but today I have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Willanie Will Pangos, who's made by Mangola. Uh, she's a professor of biology at Central Michigan University. She received her PhD at Michigan State University and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at The Ohio State University. Her research mainly focuses on how animals deal with danger, from small herbivores to even large carnivores. Uh, her research questions have taken her to many places, such as Kenya to study spotted hyenas and antelope, and to Michigan to study chipmunks. Uh, she's also developed creative teaching methods, uh, using teaching her students to learn biology through collaborations with the arts, uh, creating projects such as an interpretive dance of the dancing chromosomes. Which sounds pretty interesting to me. So please help me in welcoming you, Dr. Paul. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I want, I'd like this talk to be informal, and so I do tend to talk fast, but feel free to interrupt if you have questions. We don't have to wait for the end. Uh, and we have a you know broad range in our audience here, and so just you know let, let me know. I can always orient the talk a little differently based on what you're hoping to get out of it. Uh, I thought I'd start by introducing my accent. I'm British, and so accent is still there a little bit. And then when I get excited, I look fast, and then I lose some here. So again, let me know if I need to slow down. But I grew up in France. I had a chief and I couldn't do what I wanted. I realized pretty early on that I wanted to be outside. And then someone mentioned I could be paid to watch animals. I was like, oh, and then basically from then on, I was um, kind of you know, signed on to biology. But field ecology, field biology in France is not a field that's thoroughly developed. And I had um, the kind of parents that told me, well, if you're not happy here, look around. Uh, you know, kind of, the world's you know, big, and so go see what you can find elsewhere. Um, and I um, looked and found, well, you know, Quebec. I'm considered a resident tuition for resident tuition in Quebec, Mo in Montreal, and I thought, well, I'd be good there. Um, you don't know, Mike? It just needs to be turned on. There we go. Here we go. Here we go. by houses, very urban environments, and all of a sudden I wanted to be a field ecologist. And I remember having to convince the chipmunk researcher that he really wanted to take me as an undergrad researcher, even though I had never seen a chipmunk. Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, I can learn, I can learn. Uh, and my nightmares back then were um, along the side on, you know, that I would be walking on a trail and then the chipmunks would be having little parties behind me, but I would never see them. Uh, that was the kind of things that I dreamed about. Uh, but I love the research there, um, and I realized that was really what I wanted. That was right. That was really for me. Um, and I thought, you know, check on fun. Sure, fun. I thought, it need a bit bigger. And so I was pitching projects on mongooses, which are about this big. They read, they read havocs in the Caribbean. They were introduced in the Caribbean to deal with rats that were on sugarcane plantations. Uh, but they ate everything else. Besides the rats, including all the endangered bird species, or the turtle eggs, things like this. And so I thought, whoa, well, look at that Caribbean, so that sounds cool. Uh, and a little, little carnivore. Uh, but someone said, do you want to do this on hyenas? And there was no way I was going to turn this down. And so, um, as you heard, I ended up moving to Michigan State, where the world expert on hyena behavior is located, in all places, uh, which took me to Kenya, among other places. Uh, but I did start in Tiny, and so I thought I should probably mention my initial mentor that made all this possible was Dr. Don Kramer, who's now retired. Uh, and as you'll see, I've since then come back to books. Uh, and so it's funny how things happen in a way. And that's something that I, especially the students in the audience, that I would urge you to remember is stay open to opportunities to where things take you, and sometimes it's surprising. Uh, and it's also a small will, but so. You know, keeping the lessons open is always good. Uh, and so, you know, you might wonder, well, you are heard that I like to think about how animals deal with danger, and carnivores might not be your first go-to uh, as animals that deal with danger. Um, well, working on chipmunks, part of what you do as a student is 
to read and to read and to read some more. And my graduate student who's right here has heard me say that over and over, you just read. And when you don't know what to do, you just read more. Uh, and there's nothing that can you know, usually help more at the beginning. And I realized quickly that everybody was looking at prey for how to deal with danger, which makes sense to get eaten. And there's this kind of vacuum in how predators themselves deal with danger. And we know they don't die of old age. Most of them get killed somehow. Uh, it might be by humans, so there's a conservation aspect. But it's often as well by other predators. Um, and so when I'm looking around, that was kind of what I wanted to get into as well. You know, how do these animals deal with dangers themselves? Is it the same? Is it different? Um, there's also an increased need to understand how they deal with problems in the world we live in today, where there is more and more encroachment between these large predators that tend to have the same um, prey that they like to eat, that we like to eat. And so including in today's landscape of reintroducing wolves, uh, or coyotes coming back in greater and greater numbers, this is something that I thought uh, was relevant and we needed to understand if we want to be able to manage these populations in an effective way. Um, and so that was definitely a large interest of mine. Um, and so as mentioned, you know, usually when we look at carnivores, we focus on the role on predators and not as brains. So I wanted to kind of switch that around. Um, so I did this on, on hyenas. Hyenas, I would like to say, found me more than I found them. It's not like I was this hyena lover from, you know, little tiny bitty and always wanted to only do hyenas. Uh, and in a way, it was, um, it was a good thing because I think it kept me a little bit more open to opportunities. Um, the lab I joined at Michigan State is, held, uh, is, is led by Dr. Kay Holkamp. She's still there. Um, it's been an ongoing project for over 30 years now. And she has a research um, site that's located in Kenya, in the northern part of the Serengeti ecosystem. So Serengeti ecosystem is mostly in Tanzania. So there's a map of Kenya. And then, so the Serengeti ecosystem would be kind of like here, right there. And the little bit of it that buds into Kenya has a different name. It's the same ecosystem. Um, it'll be a different country, different names. So they call them Masai Mara National Reserve. And that's where we went. Uh, you can see our research cards and our hyenas are right there. And before I can talk more about this work, I thought I'd have to show you some pictures because it's too fun not to. Uh, rolling grasslands, uh, they are actually not that different from areas like our um, prairies in, uh, in the U.S. It, I spent a lot of time in southern Saskatchewan and to me it actually really reminded me of that landscape with one major difference, is that it's covered with animals. And so if I'm an, for an animal lover, it's kind of a little paradise. And you can see here all these ducks. Well, I mean, there's some trees too, but there's a lot of wildebeest. Uh, this is an ecosystem known for its, the wildebeest migration that walks through. Uh, and it's kind of extreme weather. There's no uh, winter or summer. There's dry season and wet season. And dry season, there's too much dust. And in wet season, there's too much mud. And so I mean, we're never happy as researchers. Um, but this is kind of what it's famous for. This giant migration that comes through. So about a million wildebeest that walk through, and when you have that many animals walking through, and that doesn't include the zebras, the Thompson gazelles, like this amazing diversity of angulates, um, angulates are things that have hooves, so lots of different species, uh, it supports a large amount of predators. And so for predator researchers, it's happening. You can see here kind of some ideas of before and after the migration, the, um, it rains, the grass was taller, uh, the scale on the picture is kind of hard to see, but the grass would get to about my shoulder height. And so for predators to hide it, that's a big deal. Uh, and after the migration, everything's moved down very, very flat. Um, and then we wait for the next cycle of rain. The uh, usual question I get first is why hide this? And I, that was definitely my mom. I, I still remember to the zoo phone call. I said, well, mom, remember how I wanted to work in the Caribbean? Well, actually, work in Kenya, you know, why? Why can't you study lions or or something fuzzy and, and cuter and, you know, something like, like our house cat is bigger. Um, and spotted hyenas are a, a behavior researcher's dream in that they are fascinating in multiple aspects. And so before I get into a little bit about what the, the research I actually did, I thought I'd introduce you a little bit on, on hyena behavior and their fascinating uh, lifestyle. 
Um, the first thing is, so if you, you might or might not know, but uh, wolves, for instance, they live in family groups. So you have mom and dad, you have um, a couple of kids, maybe a couple of the kids from the previous litter, from a year before, but they are basically an extended family. It's the same thing with lions. There's mom and dad, maybe mom has a couple sisters as well, and then the kids. So it tends to be these family groups, it's not to be small. Hyenas live in a group of up to 100. And so imagine the differences in behavior when instead of a family group, you have multiple families together on the same territory. And that really does change a lot of things. And so in many ways, hyenas have a social life that's much more similar to that of hyenas, things like baboons than it is that of things like lions, but they are still a carnivore. And so you can see we're kind of in between. And so it is a fascinating, if you like behavior, to study. Um, you can see here a communal bed. So because they're so social, they live in such large groups, um, there's a communal area where everybody puts their babies in. So mom goes and has babies, and then when they're old enough, she's got a month, she's going to bring them to this communal den area. It's a giant hole. And in here, it's right, it's right there, in between, you can't really see it. Uh, the parents do not fit in the hole. And so it's only for the cubs of all the different moms. And the cubs stop to be able to fit in that hole. They get too big about eight months. And so from one month to eight months of age, they're all together in this giant kind of cohort. Uh, and it becomes a very social spot to hang out at because moms have to come and raise babies. And so this is what you have here. You can barely see what this little Nursing. There's others here that are sniffing around, you have another one here. And so everybody comes and say hi to so the cubs, kind of hangs out. You can see some, um, this is a mom nursing, you have another mom that's kind of taking a nap. You have some that are walking around. You have teenagers and brothers and sisters that are all walking around. And so you, this is usually where I would start my day. It's like, oh, let's check out the communal day uh, and see what was happening. I'll point out here, this is an adult male. He's not quite allowed in the communal den area, and this will make sense in a minute when we keep unfolding how what I am like. But very social, so very different. And I used to joke with my lion researcher friends because they were bored out of their minds studying lion behavior. Uh, and this is what I answered my mom, which is why not lions? Because lions are active about one hour a day. The other 23 hours of sleep. And so your lion research notes look like Baby sleeping night, baby sleeping night, see sleeping night, baby sleeping night, baby sleeping night, baby sleeping, night. sleeping. Next can ten minutes sleep. Like a sleeping night, that's all you do, right? And then when all they get up, big excitement, and no, they just move and follow the shade of the tree, and then they sag back down, and then they're back to like a sleeping night. So they're very bored, and I would always joke because they would keep finding all these games to play in the cars while they were watching lions being bored, and then get the one hour excitement, like they go hunting. Whoa, a lot of things are happening, and then the hunt is over, and then you're back. When there's a hundred of hyenas, I, I had the opposite issue. I was more overwhelmed at all times rather than underwhelmed. And then there's always someone who's going to wake up puppy, who's going to let's go bite someone, bite someone. I can't retaliate because they are lower ranking, I go bite someone else, and then drama unfolds. And I often compare it to a giant sorority house, right? But there's always something going on, and it was my goal to figure out. What is it that's happening? To make sure I could record and have notes that were accurate. Um, so, very exciting from your research watching point of view. Um, I will uh, start by kind of debunking a couple of myths on hyenas. They tend to have a very bad rep. They are the wolves of the Kenyan stories. And so, in our culture, wolves are the bad guy in these stories of kids, in the folklore, in kind of the general, you know, and because they Again, yeah, like to eat what we eat, and they have giant territories, so there's going to be issues. Hyenas are that problem in uh, East Africa, and so they're not popular. They have the reputation of being scavengers. They scavenge, yes, they have giant jaws that can break through bones that are unreal. So a giraffe femur is about this big. One bite, right, and a hyena jaw can break this in half. So it's pretty unreal. So yes, they eat bones, they scavenge on anything but they still much prefer to eat um, fresh food that they kill themselves, and so they actually kill over 75% of their diet. So they are actual hunters first, but they have the benefit of being able to scavenge if times are tough. 
compared to lions, they don't have this fancy co co cooperative hunting strategies that lions have. Lions are famous for hunting in groups. Hyenas hunt alone. This is a pretty typical um, situation where you have one adult male right here that decided, okay, I'm hungry, I never get to eat, so I'm going to try today. There's a migration, there's Remember, a million wildebeest around, so it feels weird out of picture, you know, out of context. Or in a documentary, I really dislike these kill scenes because you don't see everything else in the context. And when there's a million around and they go after the, you know, the one wildebeest that's limping, you don't feel as bad. And when you know that it's going to, you know, feed babies, etc., it in context very different than, than this. But they do not stalk their prey like lions do. So lions are your typical house cat, like they hide and then they keep on it. And, Hyena is the exact opposite, and so it's quite funny because we're not used to seeing this, but they just start kind of walking towards the herd, and, you know, and then nobody cares. And so they're walking in the middle of the herd, still so nobody cares, and all of a sudden you go, oh, look at that guy, he's good, but I'll try that. And then so they slowly start to trot, and then the wildebeest goes, oh, oh, I think it might be me. And uh, they start, so that whole group starts to run, but not very fast. Uh, oh, they're still following us. And then finally, you know, they all kind of, Scatter to see who is actually getting followed, and then the dude that's followed, like, oh, that begins me. And then follows a uh, chase that will last 10, 15, 20 minutes. So it's an endurance game. It's who can run the longest before they get tired. And hyenas have these very weird running gait. Uh, and I'll show you a hyena running in a little bit so you can see it. But that's kind of what gives them their weird. If you've ever seen them in a zoo or a video, they kind of run funny, and it's actually because it allows them to have this endurance to run for quite a while. So the back legs are differently proportionate to the front legs, so it's kind of the opposite of what a lion or a cat would be like. Um, so finally, you know, and, and they're very good, they kill, uh, their success rate is 80%, which is very high in carnivore world. Lions, in comparison, is a little 20%. So you can see much more successful hunters. They're alone, they're just you know, eventually tired of prey, uh, and then they, you know, prey starts to fall, and, you know, can't quite catch up, and I'm there following with my car as fast as I can because I don't want to lose the data point of when they actually get to eat. And then there's a wildebeest researcher with his car driving as fast as he can next to me, and we're rooting for different sides because he wants to keep his animal alive, and I want mine to be eating. So uh, there's always one that gets stuck in a hole of the car. Uh, so then at the end, you push the other one out. Um, and, and finally, they you know, get to eat. This is the other part that gives hyenas a very terrible reputation. Uh, they are not in the cat family. They're not in the duck family either, by the way. They're kind of a separate branch. Anything that's not in the cat family does not have the famous um, cat way of killing. So a cat will always suffocate first. They go for the neck, they suffocate, the prey dies, and then, you know, then they can start to consume the prey. Everything else, including wolves and wild dogs and about any other carnivore, just starts to eat. They don't have the famous killing bite. And so for that reason, you always have one in a hundred where you see the wildebeest, you know, kind of looking pretty awful, but still trying to get up or it's not quite dead. Usually they go in shock, but there's always, right, the documentary where they show you the one time where the animal did not quite go in shock, and that's what gets, gets shown. And so it has that kind of nasty look to it. Combined with the fact that people think it's scavenged, it doesn't do really well for the hyenas to be. Remember giant jaw? So one wildebeest, five hyenas, 20 minutes, nothing left. You just have a little stain on the ground, horns are eaten, hooves are eaten, skulls, everything is just completely gone. It's amazingly efficient, and it's quite something to witness. Um, when you know, so this was Sigmund, as was the name of the uh, adult male that made this kill, where he killed, it's not particularly quiet, right? The prey doesn't go down without making sounds. And it, animals that are going down because they're getting eaten have a very specific type of cry that everything else is going to cue on. So before you know it, remember they live in our troops. You're going to get a ton of other hyenas that are going to show up. Wow, I heard this noise, you killed something. Let me join it, I want to eat too. And so how does that? Imagine one tricky. Thanksgiving and a hundred of you, right? It's not pretty. And so because of this, I had to drop in a couple, you know, kind of words so I can, you know, teach you things in the same time. We call this competition, but because it's within the same species, we call this intraspecific competition. So lots of, you know, hyenas that want to be the same thing. But remember, they're not alone, which I kind of forgot when I was designing the thesis. I kind of like, you know, hyenas are here, and then lions are there, and then cheetahs are here. I didn't really kind of, I guess 
in my head compute that everything is in the same landscape next to each other. So before you know it, you know, there's dust to happen. Now you have the knives that are going to show up. Of course, they heard the noise, hyenas are quiet, especially when they are all wanting to eat the same thing. Lions show up. Remember, lions are not that good at hunting. They must prefer to show up when they hear something dying. Show up and say, ooh, can we eat it too? And so what we find is most of the time the hyenas put the prey down and the lions come and steal it. Fights are about fear like this. You can't quite take this food in the middle. Three hyenas again, just one lioness is a fair fight. It'll be kind of a standstill. You add a lioness, lionesses would win. You add one hyena, hyenas would win. So that's about the ratio. Until you have an adult male lion that shows up. Those guys are walking to start from machines. That's one of the only things that I would roll up my window for because they look at you like you're weak. Like you actually feel like you're not at the top of the food chain anymore. <laughs> so you roll your it's like, okay, great, love. And they just, and they, they're kind of aggressive. And so everything backs up. There's a reason they're called King of the Savannah. I mean, you can see it. And it doesn't matter how many hyenas, I have seen a hundred hyenas disperse. They kind of back off as soon as a male lion shows up. Uh, and male lions get priority. They're very aggressive, they're kind of mean sometimes, and they will bite if you annoy them. Um, and so that you know changes dynamics. So right, you get a picture, that's it. You know, it starts to be done. The hyenas like to hunt at dawn, so about 5.30, 5.15, 5.30, right? They hunt for a while, right? They're hunting, they're chasing that wildebeest for 20 minutes, at 5.15, they're eating, it's not, everybody else shows up, 5.55, super loud, lions have shown up, male lion shows up usually as well. By 6 o'clock, lions are eating, hyenas are all around pretty mad, they just want their food. And guess when the park boundaries open up? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, it opens, all the tourists come in, what do they see? Lions eating, hyenas right on the periphery trying to quote unquote steal the food. And so you get the idea of the reputation and that kind of taken out of context aspect. Um, so it's a little bit on hyenas. I had to kind of fix things. The Lion King did not do hyenas uh, a great favor. <laughs> so every time we see the Lion King, I have daughter, I have a six and a nine year old, and all they hear me say, that's wrong, that's wrong, it's not what I can do.
So eventually he gets the idea, okay, I have to go next door, he leaves, he goes to another clan of hyenas. The only way he's going to be able to enter this close social group is if he acts submissive to every single hyenas in that clan, including the little tiny babies. So he's going to go at this age from month three, eats whatever he wants, no action, to being a new dude on the block that everybody wants action with, but he's 66. Unless he kills something, he's not eating ever. I mean, he's 66, and there's 65 hundred before him. There's no way there's going to be enough food. And so it's the kind of ultimate trade-off between sex and food. It doesn't get really clearer than that in uh, an animal kingdom. And so it's really you know, entertaining to see these guys. In the case of Hercules, he always made me laugh because he you know, succeeded. He went next door, he acted submissive to everyone, fathered lots of babies. But once in a while, he was pretty skinny. He wasn't that good of a hunter. So once in a while, he'd come home. He said, oh, I'm going to eat here for a while. And especially at the beginning of his transition out, he would, uh, we would see him pop up for a couple of days and kind of have a break and eat some food and relax a little bit before going back home where, again, he was really submissive. And basically, anybody that wanted to bite him could. Um, so, you know, hard life if you're an adult male like that. So I kind of, we already kind of did this walk through a life history. Uh, this is a pretty typical thing we do in biology to kind of understand the general patterns of what happens with these animals. As we mentioned, we are, they are raised in communal dens. They get weaned very late. Uh, again, if you know anything about cats and dogs, these guys get weaned at 14 months of age. It's amazingly late. It's one of the key characteristics of their childhood that they get milk and they get nursed for so long. It's probably because that jaw to break a large giraffe femur takes forever to develop. And so it really takes them a while before they are able to uh, do anything with their jaws. Puberty, females stay home, males leave, reluctantly, but they do leave. This is where we get very uh, interesting. And so I, you know, even though I don't really study this thing, it affects my work like it would any other hyena researcher. This is what made hyenas famous. This is what attracted uh, all the attention in the 60s and the 70s. For the longest time, we thought, Hyenas wear hermaphrodites, and this is why, right? This is what everyone looks like. So no matter where you look, right, you see this kind of picture. And finally they realize, oh, they're not hermaphrodites. This is a girl. She has what we call a pseudo penis. This is also unheard of in Animal Kingdom. Very weird. If you want an icebreaker at a party, all you have to do is pull the pictures into the penis. And an iron is what? And then this very nice, you know, kind of frozen sound. It's like everything. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't say it. Uh, this is a girl. Um, they masturbate like a boy. They, I mean, it's, you, they have some of those them just like a boy. It took me, and I know it, people laugh, it took me like a few years, three months of staring at penises to figure out boy, girl. There's a slight difference in shape. It's very small, and I still would get one wrong about once a year. You know, what I thought was a boy, we start to have babies. I'm like, okay, I mean, that was not a boy. Um, so, and it's a slight difference in shape, so yes, there's a difference. Uh, you know, the next question is, what is it? Like, what is this sort of penis thing? It's an extended clitoris, and so it's very weird. The idea is that under, um, remember mom? Mom is socially dominant on males. She's aggressive, she's defending her territory. She has a lot of male-like hormones floating around in her body during pregnancy. The idea, and that's not the whole story, this is a simplification of it, but the idea is that if you have a baby in these very high levels of male-like male -like hormones during gestation, then you're going to develop male-like genitalia. That's kind of your, your, the shortcut. Uh, it's a little bit complicated than that, but it explains most of it. And so, yes, extended clitoris. Um, hyenas urinate through this, copulate through this, and give birth through this. And so I'll let you imagine it's nasty. We lose about a quarter of our females, so the first bout of um, reproduction, ripping, and it just doesn't heal. Uh, anything that has a very large cost, a quarter of, of the females, that's a large amount of girls that you're losing there, means that they must have a huge advantage. And it, that's how biology works, right? It's got to be balanced somehow. And it's definitely the case in these guys. Imagine copulation. The girl's not in agreement, it's not happening. This is very rare, again, in the animal kingdom, to have females fully in charge. Because she needs to be 100% in agreement for the male to line up just right so things can happen. Uh, and female choice, you know, all the way. They really, they have, basically, you know, they can choose their partner in a way that most other species can't. So that's 
So that's what really made them famous. Uh, it affects social hierarchy. I have to bring it up. I can't give you a high attack without this, but we're going to move on because I don't study, um, you know, kind of the effect of hormones on behavior. Some of my colleagues did, and it's a fascinating topic, but one for another time. All right. So spotting high on sex workers. This is a girl, so a, a, a mom that had lots of babies, and this is one of her best friends from the adult male that would follow her around. You can kind of see the difference. She's bigger. She's heavier weight. You can even see it. I often you can tell just in the gait right there. Very different muscular, very different look to it. The boys tend to be very lean, they're not eating often, if you recall, they're low in that social hierarchy, and very submissive, very passive in their role. Going back to some of the work I did, uh, you can see here a map of the Masai Mara Natural Reserve. Uh, we had our camp, it's right here, that star, so we actually slept inside the, um, the reserve, which is um, always interesting because you can't have a camp being seen, for example, from above. You can't have any long lasting impact on the environment, so it's all tense. And then while I was there, I looked at two different groups of hyenas, one right on the boundaries of the park, highly affected by humans. Remember, I wanted to uh, look at how animals deal with danger, and one of the main sources of danger for these guys is humans. So I wanted an area where they were affected by humans on a daily basis. But I also wanted to see what happens if you remove the human problem, and so that was what I would call a control group, where I would look at what they do when they don't see humans very often. This is too far inside the park, these guys rarely see tourists, and they never see the local Maasai. It's too far from the park boundaries to walk into to really see them often. Uh, anytime we study hyenas, we have to collect all kinds of uh, data, including who mom and dad is, and so we would put them to sleep. I figured that, you know, you guys would enjoy these pictures, so I love them in. Uh, this is an air gun. Um, it puts a little kind of dark looking thing in the bottom of our hyenas that has, contains a drug that knocks them out for about an hour. We in that one hour, we just like a vet, we get all kinds of measurements, all kinds of uh, blood samples, we look at the teeth, all that kind of stuff. We do not treat them, we're not vets, uh, and if we treated them, we would interfere with nature and what, what's going on there. Uh, and so all we do is really, what we're really most after is blood sample, so that we can know who dad is. Without that, since dad's a Totally passive and don't help with the uh, bringing up babies, we would have no idea who the dads are. Anytime uh, we dart our first hyena, we have our official picture taken that ends up on the wall of our lab. This is mine. Uh, it's very stressful. I didn't like doing this. Uh, I don't want to study that, I'm not you know, putting little uh, darts with little pump pumps on their bottoms. And with the added pressure, nothing usually goes well. And it's not like you know, the drug has you know, problems or anything. But if you miss, the hyenas can remember a big gun sticking out of the window of the car, and then you try to shoot something at a little red thingy that came through, and you'll never see this hyena again. At the time you will pull up, they have amazing memories, they'll remember, oh, that was you, and all you'll see is the bottom run away on the other side, like the next hill. I don't want to do that, I don't want to make spooky hyenas. And so, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't deal well with that pressure, I didn't enjoy it. So my fellow assistants didn't come to the garden. They loved it, it was the coolest thing ever. Research camp, we have to show pictures of where all this stuff is happening. You can see what I mean. Everything is intense. This was my uh, home for two years. And so you can see these um, structures. It feels rustic, but we did have beds and dressing rooms and everything inside. It's not that bad, but no hot water. So that is the shovel rock right here. It's great. You say hi to the hippo and hi to the crocodile and who's that staying there? And right here. Uh, the idea was that it was shallow water and we would see them if they came. That was the reason. I, um, nothing ever happened, but never know. Somehow you still manage to feel clean after you pitch your watch for this. Uh, I love hot water, by the way. This was our research everything camp. Uh, so you can see our giant dining table. This is a hyena that was darted. If they are close to camp, we'll bring them back in the shade, kind of watch over them as they wake up. And you can see here one of my colleagues taking blood samples and processing all the samples before they can be sent back to the US. Uh, this is a lot of what happens when it's muddy. I mean, this is a, uh, you get up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock. That's not exactly 4 o'clock. Get up at 4 and you know, you try to get some coffee in here and gear up, put up all your gear in the car. It's heavy and funny. At 4.45 you're driving. You need to get there by about 5.15. We're going to want to about that time. So we try to be on wrong side by 5. And then at 4.49 you get stuck in really nasty mud and then Four hours later, it's still there trying to dig yourself out. It's, it's not fun. That was one of those mornings. I spent the morning right here on the top of the car taking pictures. Uh, 
uh, until the uh, uh, until the, the party room crew we had a giant truck pull me out. Um, we have uh, antennas to follow our highness. You can see maybe some of them had giant collars uh, around their neck to allow us to uh, find them even in the dark. This is a very high tech antennas full of duct tape that we had to take down every time we go back to uh, city life to replenish. Um, and then before I move on to kind of the science, which I want to spend the rest of the talk on, I always like to have a couple pictures of the stuff that would help us run the camp. Because otherwise I forget, I get excited about ideas and I forget to uh, remember, remind, remind me uh, to say that none of this research is possible without a whole lot of folks that are there supporting the research. And here was our main uh, camp manager that would keep the camp running so that we could watch animals all day. We had night guards. Uh, that I, uh, I that were there for the time when I was there, the single I noticed couldn't sign his paycheck every month. He would put it across, and it turned out he'd never been taught how to, you know, write his name. So we spent quite a while so that he could actually sign his name, and it was a really high moment of camp life, and he actually could, you know, put his name down on that paycheck. Uh, and he got married when he was there. We can talk about culture more uh, afterwards. And one of the reasons I put this picture is. is Yes, it's a science talk, but science is embedded within a community. And, you know, yes, it's a Maasai community. It's about as different from our community as they can get. It's a huge culture shock. And I always, I like this picture for several reasons. This was the single, the same guy that was learning how to write his name. This was his third wedding. This is his third bride. She was 14. Um, she's not allowed to look at the picture, but he was so proud to have us there. So we could take pictures. It was a huge plus. And it always reminds me never to judge a culture I don't know, I don't understand. Uh, it's, again, as different as a life as I could imagine. And the culture gap is so large that in the two years we're there, we just barely start to cross it. And to think that we're going to go into a foreign culture and be buzz buzz and help out, and we can have the best intentions in the world, but it takes a while to figure out how to navigate this by just me being there. I had more money on me at any given point between a camera, a car, you know, even Western clothing that these guys could ever imagine in their lifetime. And so trying to cross these culture gaps is part of doing research abroad and the part I thought was fascinating. And then again, one that could be an entire talk on its own, um, but I like to kind of put the slippers and kind of, you know, start this thought process. And I'm happy to talk more about this at lunch if you guys are interested. Um, I wanted to give you tidbits of what I did. I, again, you know, we could spend quite a bit on what a dissertation is like, and I have a lot of students here, and I think my main goal here is to demystify what a PhD is. I thought a PhD was like this thing, unachievable up there, and my main point to make it is no, it doesn't have to be, it's just projects put together, um, and I would argue that most PhDs, you can explain them even to your mom if you, you know, kind of use the right vocabulary. And so that's what we'll do here, is just kind of give you an, an overview of the kind of work I did. I also want to point out that I designed it specifically to have fun. Like my goal was to enjoy my years there, not to do research that someone told me I had to do or my advisor needed. That can happen, but if you have the freedom or you know, manage to get your own funding and, and gain that freedom, you should really make the research something you enjoy so that halfway through when it gets hard, you can do it. Uh, and so that was really how I came at this. I thought, well, if you're hard, you know, hyenas are great. Don't get me wrong, I love hyenas. But I wanted to be able to stop when on my way to seeing hyenas, I would teach hyenas. Or lions, or leopards. I wanted a justification to be able to turn the car off and say, no, I need to stay here to get data points. And so I had part of my work be a comparison among all the carnivores so that I could stop. I also really wanted to look at baby hyenas because I love baby hyenas. And so I thought, well, how can I design a project that makes me actually have to watch baby hyenas for as long as I want? Uh, and so a lot of it has to do with development, and you'll see development of behavior, how it comes to be, how do youngsters kind of gain the traits that make them the adults that they are. And so again, you know, when you design work, think about the things you like and try to make them line up with things that are needed or that you know advisors might want to see. And so that's here. The bulk of my work was a comparative study of all the carnivores. The rest had to be hyenas, and again, it's not like it was a burden, I loved it. Uh, but I looked at the function of hyenas, what we call vigilance, which is when animals look around, to figure out you know, why are they looking around as much as they are. Uh, development here is basically saying, how do these adult hyenas get to be this way? So what happens in these young formative years? And then I wanted to see the impact of humans on those guys. And so this 
is a fancy way to, to say what are the impacts of humans on all these behaviors I was looking at. So some kind of conservation aspect to this work. All this has been published, so if you want more, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of results, and I don't want to bore you with figure after figure. I didn't think that was the right place to do this. But if you care, or if you kind of have your curiosity adjusted and you want to check it out, put my last name in, and then you'll find all these rooms will pop up. Um, and so feel free to go dig. This is all the guys that put my hands well. There was so much fun to compare um, how animals will deal with danger. And so I, any carnivore I encountered, I filmed while eating or while resting. And so those are dwarf mongooses, they're really cute. We have belly mongooses right there. The black back jackals is kind of like the fox of the ecosystem over there. You have cheetahs right here, wild dogs are there, leopards, and obviously lions and hyenas. So kind of looking across, um, lots of fun. This is typically what happens uh, when you're watching these guys. Uh, I managed to actually get other points on all the other ones pretty easily. The cheetahs were giving me a really hard time uh, because they are not very successful hunters. And so I would fight cheetahs, but then they never were eating. And then you need carnivores eating. So I could see how much they were worried, right? The danger happens when you're eating and then the carnivore. That's when everybody else wants to show up. And so I needed carnivores eating. I was getting everyone in. Those guys, unless they actually you see it kill it, you will not get it to you not get to watch it eat. And so I did what I called my um, cheetah watchers, where I followed the hyenas until they finally decided to hunt and kill something, which would often take the entire day. Uh, and so I had um, lots of Moments with you know dead batteries and computers or phone or everything else, I'm just there going, oh please go hunt, please. Um, and they miss a lot of their hunts, and so you know it's like, come on, you can do it, you can kill this thing. And they often use the car as a lookout. So you know the first time this is really awesome. The second time it's pretty great. The third time I go, man, I'm here for a long time because when they push some stuff like this, they're nowhere close to actually starting. Them. So just looking around for you know where are prey, where are the lions, where is everything. Uh, the work I did on hyenas, I noticed as soon as I started to watch footage of hyenas that they were spending as much time looking around as my chipmunks. Remember chipmunks? They were spending 20% of the time looking around. That's an awful lot of time looking around. And people were telling me, well, they're top predator, they don't care about anything else, they want food or mix. That's what they're looking around for. And I was pretty, pretty certain that wasn't the case. But I had to make sure that I tested all possible options. Um, I was pretty certain it came from either, if you remember, intramings within their own species, threats from their own species, or threats from things like lions, which naturally kill them. But I made sure I tested all, you know, kind of covered myself and, and tested that no, they were indeed not looking for uh, mates or prey, which was the case. They mostly were worried about things um, that were either hyenas on the hands or lions, which was their main source of, um, of threat, their main threat source. Um, and so that's mostly what I sat down for this bit. And you can see here the main two uh, predators. This is a uh, hyena cub that didn't survive this picture for more than or maybe 10 seconds at the very most. Um, and I'd like to point out kind of the harshness of doing field work, and some of you probably know this already from being out in nature. Uh, we, we, as researchers, can't interfere. And so something like this was probably one of the hardest moments I had over there. And I, I knew the cub, I knew the mom, and mom was in the air, cub was stuck in the bunch, lion shows up, and you know, the cub didn't make that picture. I could have interfered. I could have opened my car door, right, drive right there, open my car, slam it hard, and the lion would have gone, oh, what's that? And you know, probably be too annoying to pursue to kill the cub, uh, and the cub might have had a chance to um, run away. But if I do that, I am rewarding but mom, where is mom? You do not leave a brand new tiny little cub next to a mud pit when lions are around. It's like, mom, hide mom 101, right? You can't do that. And by intervening, I would reward her and then her lineage gets carried on, etc. And so researchers, despite how hard it might be, we always you know, kind of remind ourselves, no, we can't interfere. Um, that includes things like this as well. This was our one of the local Maasai um, dwelling that was close to our hyena camp, our, our, our hyena clan. And I remember, you know, we get text messages saying, I have one of your hyenas, come get the skull. They knew we collected skulls of known aged hyena. And as on my drive there, I would go through like every hyena I hadn't seen in the last 24 hours, really hoping it wasn't one of my favorites, knowing I had no control over it. 
and I show up and they, they kill the hyena. And again, I can't be mad, right? They protected their life livestock, which is their bank account. If a hyena decides that it has a taste for cows, the hyena's not gonna make it. Or if the hyena walks in and threatens the kids, of course they're gonna kill the hyenas. Who am I to judge? Uh, and so it's kind of always remembering, yes, it's nasty, but right, what would we do in their shoes? Um, and so that was, you know, the main source of mortality I wanted to look at and study and see what we could do with that. And how do hyenas learn to deal with these sources of danger? You can still do experiments when you're in the field. Uh, you just have to get a little creative. So most of my experiments were what we call playback experiments. I still run a lot of these. It's a lot of fun, and uh, you know you guys can do it as well. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You play sounds to an animal, and now we have these great technology. We have little speakers. They're very easy to manipulate, and then you play sounds and see what happens. And so if I play a predator sound to a two-month-old hyena, and they hear that animal, how are they going to react? to a one-year-old hyena and it's a lion roar, to an adult hyena and it's a lion roar. How do they do it? What if they're very high-ranking? Hyena, high, is that going to change things? What if they're low-ranking? Remember hyenas? Well, you know, they still can steal food, and so a low-ranking adult hyena might hear a lion roar and say, oh, there might be food, and actually go check it out. And so you have all these kind of things that are potentially happening there that you can test with things like lion roars. And so I tested young and adult hyenas with lion roars. But like any good experiment, you gotta have a control. Maybe they just check out that there's a loud sound coming out of a research room. And it might have nothing to do with what I'm actually testing, so you want control sounds. Another loud sound comes out of the car that is not something they should respond to in a way that indicates that they care to be a proper control. And baboon one, who uses what I elected to use as a control sound, they're very loud. Baboons make these loud it sound so Sounds like Wahoo, that's the name. It's very loud, the males do this when they fight with each other. And that's one of the only things that hyenas do not eat, because everything else they eat. Uh, and so it seemed to work as a control sound, and then you run the same kind of thing, test it, and then you compare the two and see what happens. And I have a couple of videos I wanted to show you. I'll show you uh, one, because you get the sound, it's an adult hyena. Let's see how quickly I can do this. The videos are fun. This is Mutha. She's a low ranking, well, middle of the range ranking hyena that's going to hear a lion roar. She's sleeping, right? She's alone, so I can have no other interference. This is a lion roar. I know it's not like what you think a lion roar sounds like, but it's a true lion roar. And she looks. She's like, oh, okay, so it's real. Now I wanted to do the same thing with um, 
human interactions and playback experiments where we can hear it well. So let's do it again. I played the uh, cow bell sound that uh, the, the cows, especially the troublemaker cows, uh, the Maasai put bells on their collars so they can find them again. And it's a very specific sound that sounds like nothing else in the savannah. Uh, and so I played that versus uh, church bells to see the difference in reaction. And again, have they learned to associate cows, which means Maasai, which means prey gets displaced, which means potential problems, there's no food, and there's bored Maasai boys that are uh, looking at cows 12 hours a day and uh, you know get very bored and they start to do dumb stuff because they're bored, so why not you know harass nature around a little bit? And so not that good. Uh, and so none of that have the hyenas associated to be aware of that and they have. And so that was uh, some new work. And you can play these sounds in different areas of the park that are differently disturbed. Uh, some of the stuff you can see here. Hyenas are right on the boundary of the little tiny town there. This is high as I've never seen the town or a mass site building. So you can see here the kind of you know experiment you can do in nature to try to get results and get to answer some of the questions you care about. So that kind of wraps up uh, this part. I thought I'd finish with you know kind of bringing it home. I you know I, I have kids. I have not gone back to Kenya since a whole lot. Um, and you know I came home from this. Um, I love the work I did, and it was kind of my dream PhD. But I also was bothered by some aspects of it. I knew signing up for a high end project, I wouldn't do this long term in a career. And this idea of kind of sustainable research, I wanted to achieve at home. It was hard to kind of swallow the cost of that same PhD. I got fully funded, I got a lot of support, but I also was embedded in that community where, as I mentioned, um, they couldn't even envision this kind of money. And how do I justify saying, yeah, it's okay to spend on hyenas? Uh, and yes, the community does benefit from having a research camp there, and we employ folks. We serve as a local clinic, and we you know, run a taxi service pretty much because we need our own smooth car. But you still have that constant reminder of the differences between different lifestyles. And I, I realized pretty early on, I would not be able to do this long term. And so I wanted to transition to can I look at the state as my phone goes so, quiet. Um, how can I transition to doing the same kind of research questions but at home? There's a reason we don't do this kind of research in the US, is because the predators that are around us we've scared away or uh, are almost extinct. Things like wolves, we could start to ask the same kind of research questions, but we can't watch them. Uh, all the uh, wolf researchers I know that study wolf poop, which very interesting. You can get all kinds of information from the poop, but that's not what I want it. I want to watch them. Uh, and so, kind of redesigning how do we, you know, kind of transition this? And uh, there's several things that currently do. Um, some of them are actually looking at the nuts and bolts of this behavior that is vigilance. All animals do it. Uh, I don't have to be restricted to chipmunks or hyenas, and we can do this through modeling work, and so that becomes math. Uh, and uh, it's something I've been wanting to do for quite a while because of the wide range of applications. If you have results that come out of modeling work, then you can apply them to all others. You don't have to receive you watching them. You can kind of see the consequences of what happens. So very applicable, very general, very fun. I sat on this project for, I don't know, eight years or something until the right student came along. Uh, and she and my graduate student is uh, the student that uh, made this, whoa, I'm sorry, you made me just um, made this kind of work possible. And so it's kind of finding the right moment, the right person. But I also love field work. And I thought, well, okay, uh, we can look at predators. I can't look at them directly, right? And I want to look at poop. So I thought, well, let's look at the prey. And let's use the predator, the sounds, the kind of playbacks, it does that kind of thinking, and see what happens there. So kind of fit it out. And I wanted to, you know, kind of get at questions of what happens when the wolves do get extinct. They're locally extinct in, in Michigan, for lower Michigan, for most of the places. What happens when they come back, right? In the UP, they're coming back. Are they pre-adjusting? Do they remember? Do they have the behaviors to deal with this source of danger that they used to? Then it went away and then it comes back. Uh, how long does it stay around? What happens when, you know, when, what happens? Like how, what's going on even for things like um, our monkey lions and, and all these different predators that used to be common in our landscape and are not in the US anymore. Uh, to do this work, it, make, it took me to lots of fun places. I have a uh, uh, special place in my heart for Beaver Island, up on Lake Michigan. This, I, was, just, I just came back, came back a few days ago. 
um, CMU as a biological station on the Rhine. This is one of the reasons I elected to work at CMU for that place. And then this is an island. There's basically no predators. What happens when you remove the predators? Uh, and what happens when they do hear the sound of uh, a hawk that would normally be their natural predator? Uh, if you want some answers to that, you can again look at Chainin. She's done a lot of that work, and some of the preliminary analysis are look like are very fun. And definitely, we see personality emerge much strong, much more strongly than we normally would. Uh, and it makes sense, right? You take the scary stuff away, then you can really develop. You can have, be quirky in a way that you couldn't be when predators were around. Um, and so, lots of lots of fun work. Instead of looking at the right, good of the predators and trying to find ways to work, it's kind of going to the weird situations where prey are affected in different ways by the lack of predators or by being an island. Some of the work I've done is um, this is project we call Cry Wolf, um, which is looking at um, the reaction of squirrels this time based on locally extinct, extinct predators. So what happens again with these predators that used to be there no longer? Uh, it does how often they encounter these predators matter? And this was preliminary data to um, try to see, you know, can we have a long-term project on this? And the idea was, was the answer was yes. There was definitely some effects. You can see some differences. Uh, based on how often they encounter these predators. And it does sound like um, if a predator is gone, they will lose these anti-predator responses and, and you know, kind of how to deal with that danger if they don't encounter the predator. Uh, I thought I'd finish with things from home. You can also use things like uh, field cameras to see what's around. And so this is from uh, PCD Institute, was what, about a month and a half ago or so. You can catch out the predators on these cameras. I thought I'd finish on something fun. I have a um, video of Neither Cats, which is located about two and a half hours north, about straight north for a while. It's a property that CMU owns. And you can see what happens on those cameras. And so you don't have to go too far to see cool things. So the lighting is kind of bad. Can you see what that is? I had a title, so it says Bobcat on the top, which is totally gives it away. It's very cool. Someone tried to tell me it wasn't a Bobcat, it was a cat. I'm like, no, look at the ears, that's a Bobcat. <laughs> and so I, you know, the lighting is not the best to see the little details. Um, and so you can study all kinds of fun stuff, even at home. And no, you don't have to go to crazy places necessarily to answer these research questions. And so, yes, we back at Chipmunks, it's a lot of fun. Um, looking at a you know, specific prey model. One that we understand well, and it's you know how it deals with its sources of radiation in places like off you know, on an island, etc. I want to finish by uh, acknowledging all the people that make this work possible. There's all kinds of undergrads that help. Uh, Shana, who's right here, is my first graduate student, and she's kind of uh, is going to make it very hard for the ones coming after that. You know, so I'm not like her. Uh, so hard, hard one to follow. Uh, lots of you know, too many uh, sourcing or, of funding to put all on there, um, but it, you know this work doesn't happen in a vacuum. You need a whole team uh, to support and all kinds of funding to support this. Um, thanks for your time. I think we were told we had some time for questions. You can take them anywhere you want, and then I'll be around for lunch. Maybe three, three hyenas can eat one. I mean, they'll be slightly sick, but they can. Two, two, three, they 
some of the results that came out of your research. Like, how do, how, do, how do the different predators, you know, what are some differences between the predators? So it's very interesting. Uh, some of them, I know, I'll try to not get too jargony or make it too long. Um, one of my most surprising results for me was that all the predators were pretty highly tuned to their environment and were quote, quote, worried much more than anybody would have thought. And so it is anywhere between 12 and 20% of their lives spent looking around, and it's not looking around for food, it's looking around for threats. Most of the threat they're worried about seem to come from different species, but it varies according to the species we're looking at. And the lions were the ones least worried by others. They were more worried of conflicts within their own species, which makes sense. Um, the hyenas were mostly worried about lions. That was really their main source of concern about nothing else really but them. And even each other, like I was surprised. I expected the low-ranking hyenas to be worried all the time because someone can always come and, and bite them or annoy them from their own group. And I found that not to be the case. So there's a kind of a 
almost a, a certain trust that, yes, we live together, you may annoy me, but you're not actually going to hurt me. There's that understanding. And they were mostly concerned about threats coming outside of it. Um, all carnivores had, uh, you know, just regardless of the species, um, had specific strategies. So when they were eating, they were highly aware of their environments and they would have these little short bounds of, you know, imagine, again, like big turkey, 20, you know, lots of potential people coming to steal your food. They would look around a lot, but for very little tiny moments, very short little bursts of looking and then eating and then they look again all the time. And when sleeping, they actually spend the same amount of time looking around, which I thought was so uh, surprising to me. I thought they would not care. But instead of looking all the time, these little bursts, they would basically sleep, 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 and then look around for a while. And go back to sleep, 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 look around for a while. And when you actually look, it's a very different strategy. But the total percent time looking around is actually the same. And so different, very specific strategies based on the context we're in. The young, uh, I thought that if mom was spooky and was scared of everything, young would be spooky and scared of everything, that was not the case. And so it's not like because mom is afraid of spiders, that your child will be afraid of spiders. That was really true in my years. They each had a specific personality on how to deal with danger. Um, it did help if you had a twin. And so if you were part of a, a twin group, then it, they seemed like in general were less scared of things and, and, and had a higher survival. So it seems like that actually paid off, not just someone else to be buddy with, but someone else, you know, two sets of eyes to look at danger. Um, they were much more affected by humans than people wanted to believe. However, not by tourists. So that was another surprising result. The part I was in had very heavy tourism. Uh, it was next to the main gates of the park. And I mean, especially th not hyenas, because nobody cared about the hyenas, but like cheetahs would be followed like out. I would use the word harass, like by all these tourist vans watching the cheetah try to eat and hunt. And I thought, man, this must have a huge impact. It had zero impact. The cheetahs just completely ignored the tourists. And so that was a result that, and so I, I changed my words. I didn't use the word harass after that. I said, I just told them, hey, give them a little space, please. Uh, so they can hunt, but they were not spooked by all by it. However, they were by the Maasai. The Maasai really had a large impact. Both lethal, they killed them, uh, and a huge impact of how much more wary it meant hyenas in general. So the hyenas that lived close to the park boundaries were always more alert and always more on edge than the ones deep in the park, no matter what. Uh, and so definitely different reaction. That's some of the hyenas. Oh, sure. Turn for you. Yes. Well, the kids can't make it, and so usually if you have a new, uh, if you're giving birth, that means you've weaned your previous liver, so those are going to be okay. Uh, and then it all slides down, so it just removes one, and everybody stays the same under there. And so it just takes away one. You know. It's actually, if, if you think of it, it makes sense, right, to have your, the ranking right below your mom, um, in that everybody mom is dominant over, you're dominant over. And everybody mom is supported to, you're supported to as well. So it's very straightforward to learn. And if mom disappears, as long as you're weaned, you've already learned your spot in that hierarchy. If you're not weaned and mom happens to die, uh, and you're not at least a year of age, you're not going to make it. They need to be, I mean, usually 12 to 13 months before uh, they could stand on their own. First, learn the hierarchy and have mostly it's food intake. They'd starve otherwise. And so we had you know, situations where you know, mass time would kill one is fairly common. Uh, and then, you know, if you have a seven, eight month old comes around like we knew they would do it, so it's kind of it's hard because you're watching them sort of start. Um, reality of field work. I mean there's wonderful moments, but there's also kind of that you know, that other side that's it can be it can be Yeah. How were you able to tease apart the effects of the Messiah? Well, I looked at what they did when, so it's something like a, a clan that's deep inside the park never sees the tourists. So you're making assumptions and big assumptions that the difference in behavior is due to the fact they don't see tourists. And so it's not perfect. Ideally, you'd want to uh, have something where you can get a little bit more accusation and be more certain. But if, you know, you, do, you, you see the difference and then you can test it. So then I played the sounds of 
Um, you know, you can do it different ways. You can face sounds of cars coming in. How, you know, like a hyena might freak out if they hear a car, a tourist car, or not. And again, kind of base it on more direct observations. Um, same with the, the Maasai, so areas that has heavy Maasai versus not. And then, you know, experiments. Anytime you can run experiments in science, it gives you a little bit more control about what you can conclude, a little bit more certainty that the result you're seeing is really because of what you think. It's not perfect, it's still assumptions. Uh, but when I saw systematically the hyenas react the same way to hearing Maasai cowbells, and the ones that have never seen a cowbell not react that way, then I'm pretty certain that the difference I see is due to the fact that they, they know what the sound means. And they've associated the sound with certain things. So it's not ideal, but it's better than purely observation where you just watch. Um, you can still reach some good conclusions, but it, you know, if you want to tease apart, you have to start to manipulate some of those things. Those are great questions, Kelly. Alright, we have time for a couple more or probably time for one more. And I'm, I'm around even and I can stick with you too. Yeah. So what is the breeding like hierarchy in that with such a big group? Do they interbreed or are they really picky about not? How does that work? Well, so the females again have a complete say. Uh, they like the new guys that are just coming in. The young new guys that are integrating the clan at the bottom of the hierarchy. Often from Another, uh, from another area, which makes sense to it avoid. Does. Um, it does. That's exactly, it makes perfect sense. And so the new guys in, I have a rough line that they're not eating, and again, I'm just biting them and they can't do anything, but the purpose of they have a lot of opportunities to be dead. Uh, what becomes interesting is that in a lot of social carnivores, we see what we call, uh, we see the alpha individuals suppress the subordinate individuals from reproducing, and we've never really directly seen this in, in hyenas. It's not like a, a half a hyena female is going to prevent a lower ranking female from having cubs. She's not going to stop the mating, or but there's probably some things going on formal with hormones co and, and communication, some kind of suppression. These lower ranking hyenas have a lot, lot less cubs, but they're also eating a whole lot less. So how much of it is suppression? By higher ranking versus the fact that you're just not eating as much, which means you can't have as many cubs. That is hard to really yeah. extract the like, or differentiate between the two, and we haven't been able to yet. Okay, why don't we 